Mrs. Morgan. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Neela. First time I met Ms. Neela, she said something very nice to me, which touched my heart. And tomorrow there will be a tomorrow's a workshop. There's a work, I'm giving a workshop at some point. And I promised Ms. Neela I would make her a sculpture. So if you want to see what that sculpture is, then you can come. Is this going to work? Yes, he says it's not. Are you sleeping vigorously? Or <laughs> hearing? Now, I don't know if this works. Okay, what do I do? Say left, right. Is this the right one? No, that's the audio recorder. Okay. So how do I control this remotely? So I'd like to walk around. But this doesn't seem to be very nice. Which is now out of print. 
I've been informed you can get them on eBay for 750 bucks. <laughs> we can talk if you want. And I brought a couple of printing presses. This is a uh, piano Hilbert algorithm printing press, and then this has got my wood stuff on it, so if you take this rubber band off and stamp it on your wrist, I'll let you out of the building. And then you can come back in. Are we ready? Okay. I'm going to have to be in a special place to have this work. Now, Ludmila left out a lot of stuff in the introduction. She didn't say that I was a computer designer, a computer architect. Okay. It's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the computers that I architected. What is it? An abacus. What kind of abacus? Binary. Binary. Binary abacus. I made uh, some of these with large blocks to get to uh, our grandchildren. So they're learning from a tender age you know, how to compute. Anybody recognize the number on there? <laughs> this is, uh, I've never seen one before. I think it's a really good idea. What's the, I and mean, this brings us to a certain point, you know. What's sculpture? Well, this is an arithmetical engine. What's the simplest possible arithmetical engine? For me, uh, sculpture has to be something that's uh, primitive, that you can perceive it uh, in just about eight seconds, which is our normal attention span for unusual things. But this is lacking something. We're in the 21st century. We have electricity. So I architected another computer. You recognize those? Now the thing about this computer is it's independent of any power source other than your digits. <laughs> so you operate it with your digits. Okay. It's really pretty therapeutic. And I took these light switches and, of course, tore out all the electronics because who needs that stuff? And then, well, one of these things, yeah, but it's a really nice little out because, you know, they go, oh, 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 that, that <laughs> I, I got to convert it to decimal. This is a very bad song. You will probably. Uh, four plus, eight, four plus eight plus 64 plus um, uh, 512. Mm -hmm. I'm as old as dirt, but um, so you were not one of my grandchildren. Okay. Um, I'm going to Tora, MC. This is one of my first you know, pieces that involved a milling machine. This thing seems to be coming on and off. Are you sure you all? Okay. Everybody that wants to hear me. Okay. Uh, this is a piece of bronze, but before it got to the bronze stage, an awful lot had it happened. I use the three-axis milling machine to articulate the surface. And the surface is a Hilbert piano Hilbert curve. In fact, I use the milling machine to build this printing press. And uh, I'll print you out a unique uh, piece with its own edition number. This has been on the cover of a number of calculus books. Anybody seen it on a calculus book? I met a young woman who's had it on her calculus book. She said, the only way I got through that calculus book. 
Okay, the umbilic torus is a structure which has an outside and an inside. In fact, here are a couple. Of, does this have a laser thing on? Ooh, okay. Here's the one you were kind of just looking at in Ferrara marble now. And here is the outside. So, the inside. Right? This has a triangular cross section, which is a hypocycloid with one cross. Not a triangular cross section. Hypocycle. This has to do with the fact that the origins of this piece are in the uh, business of fundamental representation, BL2R action on binary cubic form. The stratification. Kind of like yeah. Okay. So three times the long way. Once the short way. Here, once the long way, three times the short way. So this one I call the, okay, which is it? This is a quiz. Yin or yang? <laughs> which? Both. What? What hope? Because it seems to interpolate something and goes from one one to another. Okay. The yang part, that's this one. Well, you can see I've got some symbols here. Here is a uh, parametric presentation mm -hmm. cross section. And then here is a symbol that you find on doors. And if you're the other, don't go in that door. Right? Now here's this one. This is the outside of it. So each is the inside out of the other. Okay? Each is the inside out of the other. And here the symbols are correspondingly different. And the only difference between this parametric part and the previous one is that minus sign. Symbolic, what would you expect? Yeah. Now, how did I make those? Well, I projected uh, certain class parametric 3D equations into these two blocks of Ferrara marble. What I have here, the very arm, now, okay. See these cables? I'm standing in the middle of the triangle. This is a steward platform. The word platform is attached to a computer, which, commu which I communicate with the guts of this computer with this probe. As I touch the stone at a certain point, and it tells me how far to drill, or cut, or what I'm doing. In other words, I'm going from this virtual um, equation, image, whatever, into the block of stone. Why would I do that? Well, here's another piece where I've actually got the two linking together. So here's the there's the yang part, here's the yin part, but you can see that they really do fit together in this curious way. How did I do that one? This is not marble. Anybody recognize the material here? Comes from a rapid prototyping machine. Rapid prototyping machine is cornstarch. <laughs> now, with these rapid prototyping machines, how big can you get? Thirty-five times thirty-five. Yeah, not too big. I just get a little bit bigger. But you don't get to take my favorite piece of ten foot. Stone, coarse diorite, and stick it in this rapid <laughs> prototyping machine. Now he said rapid. I guess I could, I could be members of the audience, right? Can I do this? Is that a good idea? I just attempted to point to the person, that person. Okay. So that's a problem for me as a sculptor. Two problems. 
first problem is how do I make something bigger that is equal size? How do I make uh, something much bigger? Out of a material that I really love to work with, something that's uh, a billion years old. Now, a billion years old, that's a suitably aged uh, stone. Now, part of my design language is mathematics, algorithms, if you will. And that uh, is kind of timeless, isn't it? So from this rapid prototyping uh, environment, I make that. Uh, not everybody has been to a bronze foundry. Just to give me some idea, how many people have gone through bronze casting processes? Three, six? Okay. You ready? So you pour it out of your mind? You don't mind. Okay. First we make a positive image. And then we're going to pull, make a mold of that, pull these waxes. See the Bunsen burner there? There's a good flame there. Maybe. That wax goes into this shell room. This is stirred 24 7. Then you hang it up like a bunch of bats in the cave to dry out. Here we're looking under the skirt of the kiln because we're going to take the ceramic material and then vitrify it. After it's vitrified, we bury it in sand, fill this crucible full of molten bronze, and then after that's done, you can see a little bit of the bronze exposed here. Just smash, take a hammer and smash it off this uh, ceramic shell material. So we've gone from a positive form, positive wax, negative mold, right? And then, uh, well, negative primary, positive form, negative mold, positive wax, negative ceramic shell, and finally, positive bronze you can prove it. You get something like this. Zero to infinity and nothing flat. Well, before you get there, you gotta get all kinds of stuff done. That's a sandblaster. Looks like a face, you know, it's not upside down there with no You put your hands through the eye sockets here and you grab your piece and blast it with a sand. Then you cut off all the extraneous things by leaving a lot of things out. And you may have a little bit of welding to do for the bronze. We've been casting bronze for 10,000 years. And then you do a patina or you polish it. Pretty good to look at it. So there's our uh, Coons hash, the other side. When people get these things, I am very important. But still, that's not very big in some respect. And if I've got it for my life, then how do I make it bigger? I have a CRADA, a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, between my studio, which is now in Baltimore, Maryland, and NIST, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, in Gaithersburg. These are your tax dollars at work. They don't pay me anything, but we do some pretty wonderful things. Now you see, what do I got there? There's a little thing there. A little thing there. That's a piece of sculpture. I want to enlarge it. First thing I do is tape it up. Now this is a movable pair. Each of these things rotates inside and out the other. The dynamical piece. All this moves. So I've got to take so I won't move. Why? This is another Stuart platform arrangement of this. And this guy here is a freaking genius. <laughs> That's Jim Alvis. He's a NIST fellow. And uh, 
I didn't know he was a freaking genius until he retired. I just thought he was the brightest engineer I'd ever worked with. <laughs> so he built these kind of steward platforms. Well, there's my handy hydraulic voice. Sitting on there is a block of what? Styrofoam. Yeah. I was hoping somebody would say marble. <laughs> <laughs> Man, here Jim has got his hand over there on the actual uh, thing. So I was hooked up to a chainsaw. See the chainsaw? And this Stewart platform just kind of dances around according to how you move your hand, how you part it there. Isn't that interesting? You ever seen anything like that before? Yeah. Down at the local uh, Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> so here we're starting out, uh, you can sort of see that form beginning to emerge. But in principle, remember that uh, umbilical of Taurus piece that had the little bumps on it? Especially the yin one, you know, very suggestive bumps. Those are registration points. They're not what you think. And How big is that block of sight? This? Oh, uh, it's about uh, two feet, or let's see, about three feet this way. Okay. Uh, two and a half feet that way. About that. Not very good. This is the counter set. But you can see the rotating tool here. We tried a whole lot of different things. Okay, anyway, making stuff. There. In principle, I could use that to carve stone. In principle, now they call these rapid prototyping machines. You know why? Rapid humans. This has this incredible propensity to just flat out lie. There's nothing very rapid about it, especially when you count all the time. It goes into programming. Okay. Well, here's a crackle. Don't blame her. I've got a couple of bronzes that are sort of interesting. What are these? Okay. If you take that uh, crackle snowflake, stretch a membrane over it, and thump it, you've got a drum now. What will emerge? Well, we don't know because the fractal is an infinite construction. How do you solve the Derek Lyle Floss equations, right, for a fractal boundary? At the time this was done, it had never been done before. A couple of texts. Of course, once you do Derek Lyle boundary conditions, meaning fix the function, fix the membrane on the boundary, then uh, this is F sharp. In case you ever wonder what F sharp looks like. But suppose you do Neumann boundary conditions, solve that. Now here, the boundary is allowed to move. And when you move the boundary, this is kind of like looking at something on um, Go. So what do we have? A drum? Go. A bar? Now, this part of the talk, I don't think any of you have ever seen it. anything quite like it. This is a piece that uh, Hamilton College is located outside the uh, Science Center, which, for the benefit of all concerned, me, is uh, a very green building. Well, I guess you can see it's sort of green. This is a very green sculpture, believe me. This is granite. There are two colors of granite here. Uh, they're each about a billion years old. Suitably aged material. Okay. And we have a couple of hyperbolic disks. This one is the Poincaré model of hyperbolic geometry. This one is the Klein model. Hmm? Yes, the Klein model. The Klein model of hyperbolic geometry. What's the difference? Here, geodesics are given by arcs of uh, circles that are perpendicular to the boundary of the disk. Here, 
it's not conformal. Now there are two uh, two kind of terrible things here. One is for being kind of perfect, marred, kind of angry. But not the Venus, not the Mars that you know or think you know. This is based on an algorithm created by the Mayans 400 years before Kepler to predict the behavior of Mars. Pretty cool. I'll summarize their algorithm. Um, this piece is called Syzygy. Y'all know this word, Syzygy? Who wants to spell it? In public. It's what our S-Y-C-Y-G. What happens when you talk to a computer literate <laughs> group? <laughs> What does it mean? Syzygy. Coincident or alignment. And alignment. Planet, planets. And as you can see, these two pyramids line up. You walk around the sculpture, they line up. Syzygy, that's a beautiful word. Does anybody know what it means in the original Greek? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Isn't that remarkable? I thought that was pretty remarkable. But it turned out that Harvey and Vicky, I found them, they were in Texas. This was the height of Katrina. I was kind of worried about them. You can see, you know, they may be pretty vulnerable down there to hurricanes. And uh, found out what they were doing. And they had a paper in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. in which they talked about what the Mayans did 
Now, the Venus material in the four codices known, you know, Bishop Landon was busy down there when they first moved in on the Mayan culture, burned everything in sight, and only four of these codices survived. Mm -hmm. And the Venus component was, uh, that code was cracked early on. So what do we have here? Mars. Nobody knew what that stuff was about. So I built this sculpture based on it. Here's a, uh, I'll let you reflect on that. Sexy and human sex, the continuum. So here's Venus there, somewhere around the room. And here's the crux of the story. What were those Mayans up to? Now when Harvey and Vicky and Tony Ben wrote that paper for the proceedings in the National Academy. They did not use the language I'm about to use. Here's what the Mayans were up to. They took a free group on two generators. They discovered some relation on this free group. The free group consisted of long cycles, short cycles. And they discovered this is for, now which, uh, where are we on? We have the flying model. So naturally this goes with Mars. By the way, the Mayan Venus and the Mayan uh, Mars are not anything like our you know, Greek inherited Venus and Mars. Not Africa, no. They decided to you know, when they have a war, they were very well thirsty. I think they both look at it in the mail. So, um, that's the answer. This is the word, long and short, in this free group. And they found that uh, they could interpret the orbit of Mars in exactly these terms. And that was their algorithm. Produce a word on a group. Now, a lot of our algorithms have to do with exactly that. So here's Syzygy, why not? Uh, so we just say goodbye to uh, Syzygy there in front of the nice green building and the fire hydrant, just in case it's not as green as they thought it would be. Okay, here's another piece. This brings us to the uh, negative Gaussian curvature part. I actually used the milling machine to uh, develop this piece. And again, you can't get very big on a milling machine. These nine pieces, that's the D4 symmetry, they compose into this pair here. Anyone recognize the underlying mathematical surface? It's the first non-trivial topology of a minimal surface. Goes by the name of Costa surface. So, so Costa was a graduate student. Nobody told him this problem had not been solved since the time of oil. It's a good thing to have graduate students, right? It's a good thing not to know them. So here is a, a mathematical version of that. Now generally the way I use uh, tools like Mathematica is to present stereo pairs. So you can see here it says right, I left out the left. But you know how to use stereo pairs? Okay, it's great, right? You can visualize stuff. And you have a virtual studio there. You can try a lot of things. What are computers most good for today? For, we're trying to talk about virtual studio context. Free visualization. Yeah, why? There's no cost. There's no cost, right? And there's a small upfront cost. Yeah, there's a big capital cost. But there's something else about it.
He smiled. He just had some amazing adventures going through the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> so here's the piece. It's all blocked up on this truck. And you know, we'd be tooling down the road, and people would come up next to us, and they'd be sitting there for a while, you know, at our 3 o'clock, <laughs> or at our 9 o'clock, um, you know, just trying to figure out what on earth that was. And then they'd say to themselves, oh yeah, negative calcium curve. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think so. <laughs> you don't? <laughs> now, here's the, this is Brian over here. This is uh, Elon. We're hooking up this, uh, this is a 75-ton frame. We're going to put this in position in St. Paul, Minnesota, at McAllister College. It's outside the Olin Rice Science Hall. Notice that Elon is dressed in his Alaska pipeline uh, overcoat. I got on a sale somewhere. Brian there is a, a rigger. You know what a rigger is? He's somebody that you know, puts uh, harnesses around things so they don't get out of control. Brian there <laughs> is used to 15 degrees below zero. Okay, here's the piece in transit. Brian did his work well. It, as you can see, Brian is a cool dude. And uh, here's the piece there. This is a hard bunch of people here in Minnesota. It's 15 degrees below, you know. They're standing around like it's California sunshine. The scale of the river Sam Wagon was a member of the Snow Kings. Sam Wagon was right there. And that's, he was a member of the Snow Kings. Sam Wagon also was the patron of this state. The reason I did that stupid snow carving was, well, I think it's snow is But in some respects, it's a lot like snow like stone because it does not have much tensile strength. You know, you don't get to do this sort of thing with snow. Or with stone. The Greeks and Egyptians found that out. That's why they had so many pillars and everything. Yeah, that's standing right there. How much of this culture weigh? Really, is this the 11 tons there? Or is that I started out at 11 tons a lot. Got it down to 3 tons. So, negative Gaussian curvature from really activates it. And this is designed for people to crawl through. On the crawl through business, the legal department at Callister College was quite concerned because people were crawling through it. Kids uh, were showing up on the campus, getting their pictures taken, crawling through this rock. They finally just gave it up. Well, that was by design. Because as I pointed out in the Ryan's here, our bodies are mostly negative. Galaxy curvature. We are going into detail. Yeah. I don't know, what is this? It says algorithm on it. This is the navicular bone algorithm. My wife had a problem with her foot. As you can see, it's a problem there. <laughs> and uh, she was not going to be able to ever walk or dance again. And, uh, we thought that was no way to live. So she found this marvelous surgeon in the show. And we attended a uh, kind of symposium. He and his uh, foot and ankle specialist. And the idea was to kind of create an algorithm. Now, I think there's a paper in the work somewhere. I don't know if it's appeared or not, but this was the navicular bone algorithm. This uh, 
new marks on this outside structure, which is what the algorithm has to do with it, you know, the intersecting plane. Going back to the molecular bone, it's a fairly vulnerable bone. It uh, breaks, cracks, causes a person a lot of pain, like they can't walk. This is not like quite a cool problem. But uh, you get one and only one chance to install a screw to knit that bone together. So I have here a copy in marble of the navicular bone. And we rotated it around. So you see these quadrants in there. And basically, that's the way these surgeons do this uh, decision about where to put the screw. It's a question of orientation. Mathematically, think about the you know, Grassmannian manifold around the navicular bone, and you got it. Okay. Now, there's a beautiful fountain. This is in Maryland at the Maryland Science and Technology Center. This is Lake Fibonacci. In case you've ever heard of Lake Fibonacci. This is the Fibonacci fountain. And the water cannons are located at Fibonacci Mother Campus. So I'm celebrating here uh, the Fibonacci sequence, this two-term recursion which is pretty fundamental stuff. I have a question generally of Dr. Arabat and Camille Formas and all kinds of other people. Was Fibonacci, Leonardo Apisa, the first guy to come up with this sequence? Nobody seems to really know the answer. I have my own ideas about it. But this fountain, by coincidence, I installed this fountain about 800 years to the day from the publication of Libra Abaci, which revolutionized the river. Now the geese, a lot of geese in Lake Fibonacci, they, they would kind of like this fountain. You know? I think it's the big mother goose or something. I don't know what geese are thinking. But Fibonacci numbers are ridiculous. Here's a two-dimensional piece I did. The amazing figure five in a hyperbolic plane. There's a painting by the view. And I cribbed his five. Here's the uh, profile of the fountain. And as you can see, we've got uh, that's here now. On a computer, it's a really easy matter to just, you know, lay out equal thicknesses. And then position the water can there. This is an essential singularity. But it's another matter when I've got a hundred slabs of stone that come out of a stone mill in Minnesota. And the only thing they can guarantee is fact is that they're four inches thick. Okay. That four inches may be a little more, but less than four and a half inches. So how do I solve the problem of making sure that the layers see these uh, these are the panels. Each one of those is 1,500 pounds. Those panels, right, have to line up. How do I do it? Pigeon Hall of Principle. Very fundamental thing in that matter. Especially number here. There's the distribution. And sure enough, all less than four and a half. Bigger than four. So I can get the accuracy on the slabs within a sixty-fourth of an inch if I just pick the right slab. This made me a believer in statistics. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something about this. What does this have anything to do with the matching numbers? 
This one just about blew me away when I discovered it. What does this have to do with the Well, got a group in the plane. Right? This is the reflection group. These are right angle pentagons. This is a checkerboard of pentagons. You can play checkers on them. Where did the Fibonacci numbers come from? That? that really freaked me out. So I thought Fibonacci numbers were worth celebrating. Here's one of those 1,500 pound slabs dropped down by a crane. This guy here, that's me. I'm scared out of my wits. I do not do well with ice. But, you know, you do what you can. So there it is with the profile and all. Beautiful fountain. What's going on here? Expansion? No. Hmm? No. Steam. Fountain got hit by lightning. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> so after some diving and stuff, we got a nice rainbow. Does anybody recognize this man? Uh, 
Uh, another analogy, um, people that work with uh, virtual environments, it's a completely different thing if you have had studio experience when you come to that virtual environment. Uh, a friend of mine was my, now a scuba uh, instructor. He said, after you have you know, been certified and you're comfortable in this three-dimensional environment, then when you look at these movies by Jacques Cousteau, people like that, they'll, they'll be a completely different experience. And that's the way it is with uh, computers and artists, I think. If you don't have that uh, Studio experience is a haptic, hands-on kind of thing. Then the pictures that are on the screen don't mean even remotely the same thing. Even though you may have created the software, it's a completely different thing. That's really nice. yeah. I agree. You agree? <laughs> hey, you agree? In a sense, but not in a sense, but not in. In every argument, you, you mentioned about the negative Gaussian curvature as the non plus ultra of. Uh, as a what? He said the German term, the extremal part of, of the strength. But, it goes. Uh, I agree with what you say in part. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> but the positive Gaussian curvature does the same. X you know, they are very stable, and uh, Waltz, and, uh, and uh, Buckminster Fuller, Geodesic Ghost are very stable, but they are not so beautiful. So the argument should be more. They are equally strong, but more beautiful. Thank you. The services of negative Gaussian curves. Why do they want you? Because we don't see them every day. We do. You're covered with them. Right. That's okay. That's right. Topologically, what does it mean? Does that improve? <laughs> Humans are toruses, right? Yeah. And these negative Gaussian curvature forms are triply punctured toruses. Okay. When we shake hands, <clears throat> we're going to shake hands higher. I don't quite touch. Now that big stone sculpture, the space between the two hands. Now when we shake hands, we meet somebody for the first time. For the first time, right? We get really intimate. We press our negative Gaussian curvature parts together. So, you know, our bodies are primarily made up of all this negative Gaussian most people don't have this language to think about. <laughs> Two weeks ago, I gave a uh, ceramic uh, sculpture workshop. So we did. And I did a curvature. They were doing these human figures. Open their eyes. 